MIPS processor. And um, this is the combinational implementation. So a combinational implementation, what I mean is that you, so there is a clock, which when ticks, you get the new PC. And then you compute this whole thing. And again, the next clock comes, you register the new program counter and the process comes. Okay. So essentially, as you can see here, the clock frequency is determined by the time taken to do this whole computation, which is why it's called a single cycle implementation. So in one cycle, you're doing, the, doing everything. Okay. So we talked about uh, the multi-cycle implementation of this, where essentially what you do is you put uh, pipeline latches. These are not exactly pipeline latches, but these are latches so that you can carry the data from one cycle to another. So essentially what happens is that um, in the first cycle, you will do whatever is needed to be done in the instruction fetch stage. And the instruction register will store the result of that. Next cycle, only this particular stage will be active. It will be reading the register <coughs> file and, and uh, doing the zero and sign extension. And then uh, whichever wires cross this boundary will hold uh, the values um, of this cycle, whatever is completed. Next cycle, only this stage will be active. And the next cycle, this stage will be active. And the next cycle, this stage will be active. Okay. So essentially, what we're doing is um, you are now having smaller cycles. But each instruction takes five cycles to execute. Okay. And the question arises, which one is better? The single cycle combinational implementation or a multi-cycle implementation? Right? So, um, so here is an example that we talked about last time. Um, so suppose you are, so usually the, the stages are not valid <coughs> because there are different things happening in each stage, so the times will vary. So assume that instruction fetch takes two nanosecond, and your uh, decode register file read takes one nanosecond, execution takes one nanosecond, data memory takes three nanosecond, and write back takes one nanosecond. And let's assume that branch frequency is twenty percent. So I mentioned this last time also. Um, that if you look at this one, the branch instructions take four cycles to complete. Right? So one, two, three, four. This is where your PC is known, next cycle is PC. Similarly, store instructions take four cycles to complete, because in this stage, your store gets written, the value comes in, and the address comes in. Okay? So we don't need five cycles for store. Everything else will require something to be written to the register file. It will require the fifth cycle. Okay? So with this particular data, we can compute um, whatever we want to compute. Okay, so we have branch frequency 20%, store frequency 10%. Um, assume that multiply divide frequency is 5% and they take longer, they take 30 nanoseconds. Okay, right. So, and total instruction count is 100. Right? So, given this particular configuration and given this particular program, so of course we're talking about a particular program here, um, where 20% branch, 20% store, and so on. We want to compare the multi-cycle implementation with a single cycle implementation. Okay, so let's see how to do that. So the first thing that we calculate for multi-cycle implementation is cycle time. Okay. So it says three nanoseconds. Why is that? Well, that's because uh, the longest stage takes three nanoseconds, right? So that's why. So every stage has to be have to be uh, <coughs> three nanoseconds. So that gives us a frequency of 333 megahertz. Okay. All right. And we can calculate CPI. So branches take four cycles and 20%. Okay. Stores take four cycles, 10%. Multiply, divide, take 10 cycles, right? Three nanosecond cycle, 30 nanoseconds. Okay, all right. 5%. And whatever is left will take five cycles. So that gives us a CPI of 4.9. Okay, all right. So as I said, it should be close to five. Um, slightly below because of store and branch. And as you can see, because the multiplied divide frequency is so low, its high latency actually doesn't affect much. Okay. So now we can calculate execution time of this program, which has 100 instructions. 
So 100 times CPI times sine. Okay. So that gives us 14 into 5 times. Okay. Any question on this calculation? All right. So what about the single cycle? So in single cycle, everything will compute in a cycle. Okay, right? So you add all these things up, you get 8 nanoseconds. That's your cycle time. That gives us a frequency of 125 megahertz. Okay. So first thing to notice is that your multi-cycle frequency is not really five times higher. Okay, that's the first thing to notice. So yeah, the ratio is between two and three. <coughs> and the reason is that, as you say, your cycle time in this case gets determined by the longest stage. Okay. And there you lose a lot actually. Like for example, your decode register file stage, you'll have to wait for two nanoseconds doing nothing. Okay. Because the cycle time is three nanoseconds. So what's the CPI for your single cycle implementation? Well, pretty much everything remains unchanged. So um, here, everything takes a cycle, right? There is, even though branches compute early, you have nothing to do actually. You cannot really exploit that. You have to wait till the cycle boundary. Because in a clock system, there is nothing that you can do in the middle of a clock. You can compute and wait for an event to happen only at the clock boundary. Events happen only at clock boundary. So 95% okay? so instructions take one cycle. These five percent instructions are going to take longer. And how long do they take? Well, they require selling of 30 over 8 cycles. So that gives us a CPI of 1.15. So again, notice that your multi cycle CPI is not really five times of that. So the ratio depends on a lot of things. You just cannot blindly say that my multi cycle CPI is going to be five times. So, what's my execution time? 100 instructions times CPI times cycle time, 9 to So as we mentioned last time, uh, in most cases, you should expect that your combinational design will be better in terms of throughput. So as such, there is no reason to do this to a multi-cycle implementation. Okay. You will do this, we will see actually concrete examples of that in processors. Um, certain floating point units are made multi-cycle because there you can actually save area. Okay. Here you save nothing, you lose in purple. By doing a multi cycle implementation. Okay. Right. So, is this calculation clear to you? So, here is one more example which takes a balanced pipeline. Okay. So, here we assume that all your stages take the same time. Okay. Let's see in that case what happens. Right. Everything else is unchanged. The only thing that I have changed is I have made every stage 2 nanoseconds. Okay. All right. So, now my multi cycle cycle time is 2 nanoseconds, frequency is 500 megahertz. Right. CPI, so everything remains unchanged except this particular number is going to change. 30 nanosecond means now 15 cycles. Okay. Right. So that becomes 5.2. So as you can see now actually your multiply divide actually hurts you a little bit. You go beyond 5. Okay. Okay. And you can calculate your execution time which turns out to be 1040 nanoseconds. What's, the, what's happening in the single cycle side? My cycle time is 10 nanoseconds. Okay. Right. Frequency is 100 megahertz. So now you can see that the ratio is exactly 5. As you would actually expect. If you have a balanced pipe, you get a five times slower clock in single cycle. You can calculate the CPI. 95% instructions take one cycle, and 5% multiply divide will take three cycles. That gives us 1.1. Again, very close to five. You can see that the ratio is almost close to five. Okay. And as you calculate your execution time, you run slower than the multi cycle. It's 1100 nanoseconds. So why, where do you actually lose in this case, in the single cycle divide? Branching storage. Yeah. 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 yeah, can you write that? Mm -hmm. They will run for uh, less time. Mm -hmm. They will require only few cycles. Exactly. So here, branch and store instructions will run for four cycles. And how much is that? Eight nanoseconds. Okay. Here, they will be finished by eight nanoseconds, but we'll have to wait for two nanoseconds. Because events will occur only at cycle boundary. That's why we lose in those <coughs> nanoseconds. So you can actually calculate that the deficit comes exactly from that, the 60 nanosecond deficit. Okay, right. okay so it's clear to everybody. So what happens in unbalanced pipe, what happens in balanced pipe? And so no question? Alright. Okay, so now, um, so often multi cycle designs are used as an intermediate design. Um, before you go to pipeline, right? 
So if you look at the multi-cycle design carefully, you'll find that um, in the second cycle, I know if it's a branch. Right? So if I go back, so here I decode the instruction in the second stage. Okay. So I know that it's a branch instruction. Right? Okay. So in this case, um, if I know that it's not a branch, then I can actually start fetching the next instruction because I know that it's the next instruction will be um, sequentially next address. Right? Okay. So that's one option. Um, also, when the ALU is doing an addition, let's say, the decoder is actually sitting idle. Right. So when you say that uh, in a multi cycle design, first cycle will do fetch, next cycle will do decode, the fetch will stay idle, the next cycle will do execution, the decoder will stay idle, and so on and so forth. Right? So in summary, exactly one phase is active at any point in time, it wastes a lot of hardware. Right? So, so you can form a pipeline. What you can do is you process five instructions in parallel. Um, each instruction is in a different stage of processing, called a pipe stage. And how do you synchronize between pipe stages? You put pipeline latches in between. Right? So this is what it looks like. So now stage boundaries need pipeline registers or latches. Right? So wherever you see a red wire crossing a blue dotted line, you know that you need a pipeline register there. Right? So for example, um, here, this is what this is a pipeline register which contains your instruction. Okay, all right. Here, for example, you have to hold the zero or sign extended operand. Okay. Here, you have to hold the two operands coming out of the register file, the pipeline register, and so on. And so, forth. Okay. similarly, here you have to contain the comp comparison outcome. You have to hold the the ALU outcome. You have to hold the Store value coming out of the register file and so on. Okay, right? Okay, so so these are the pipeline registers, and that's how you are going to synchronize. Whenever a clock ticks, things will move from here to here. Things will move from here to here. Things will move from here to here. Things will move from here to there. Okay, all right, and so on. So another thing you notice is that although I have put the register file here, the register file write actually happens in this stage. Okay, all right, so keep that in mind. It's just a physical design, but but the actual operation happens here. Okay. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up whichever value goes to register file, and actually that will happen in a second. Okay, so these are these are pipeline um, mixed processor. Any question? So what we gain, what we lose? We gain in terms of parallelism because we are extracting parallelism from a sequential instruction stream. This is known as instruction level parallelism. And this is pipelining is the simplest form of ILP where you essentially form a pipeline of instructions and execute, well, try to execute five instructions in parallel if you have a five stage pipe. And ideally, you should be able to complete one instruction every cycle. Ideally, one instruction will enter into the pipeline every cycle and one should leave. So ideally, your CPI should be five times smaller okay, compared to a uh, compared to a compared to a single cycle um, compared to a single cycle or multi cycle design. Um, if you assume that you know there are there are no multiply by type operations, right? your CPI should drop by five times because because it would look like you are finishing one instruction every cycle because if you if you observe at the end of the pipe, one instruction will come out every cycle. All right. What do you lose? So each pipe stage may get lengthened a little bit due to control over it. For example, these latches are not really ideal. Okay. They have something called a skew time, they have a setup time. Okay. So whenever the clock ticks, the value really doesn't get transferred from input to output. It takes time. Um, <clears throat> so that limits the gain due to pipelining because essentially now what's happening is that and this shown in this example, your um, fetch latency may not be exactly two nanosecond anymore. It will be slightly more than that. All right. So that's one problem. So each instruction may take slightly longer. So essentially, that will affect your CPI. This will really not be five times more. Would there be resource conflicts? So that's one problem. Like. 
Here you can see that my register file is going to be needed in two stages, right? Here I'm going to read from the register file. Here I'm going to write to the register file. And now both of these stages are going to be concurrently executed, right? One instruction will be reading from the register file. Some other instruction will be trying to write to the register file. Okay, right? So there may be a resource conflict also that we have resolved in some way. Similar problem with this memory here. Right? Instruction fetch will require uh, accessing memory and your data memory stage also will require accessing memory. Okay. And uh, this is where the risk versus sysk debate becomes fairly complicated because in risk, if you look at the instructions in architecture, they are very clear about what stage should require what resource. It's very clear actually. If you look at the ISA, you can figure it out immediately. In sys, it's not at all clear. <coughs> when looking at an instruction, it will be very difficult to figure out what all resources the instruction will require to execute. It may require five instruction accesses to complete an instruction. Okay. So you may be actually, you really don't know how many times you will require the memory resource to complete that instruction. So that's, that becomes very difficult. So in that way, risk is much easier to pipeline in this case. Um, you require bigger memory bandwidth now because you will have to access memory twice every cycle, one for instruction, one for data, okay, right? Because they will be happening concurrently now. So uh, overall, execution time uh, goes down. That's the overall benefit, um, even though you have these shortcomings. Okay, right. Any questions? So um, pipelining <coughs> has one major problem, and these are called pipeline hazards. And we have already looked at some of them. We're talking about simple pipelines. That um, so there could be two types of hazards, right? One is that when you get an input, you really don't know what to be done on that input. We have seen one example of that. You might have forgotten, but you can review that in your slides. And the second problem was that you want to do a computation, but the data may not be available in time. So there are two different types of um, hazards that can happen. So if you look at this slide, um, you can actually figure out what kinds of hazards to expect here. Okay. So one problem, as you can see here, is uh, of the, of the first kind, that is, you don't know what to do, that involves a program counter. Uh, because your uh, program counter gets updated here if it's a branch instruction. Right? But you have fetched the instruction already here. The next instruction to be fetched should be here, okay, should be happening here, but you really don't know what to fetch because the program counter is not yet updated. Okay. Right? So that's called a control hazard. Right? And the second problem arises uh, because suppose you are um, having an instruction which produces a value, so it writes to say register 20. Right? And the very next instruction <coughs> reads from register 20. So the first instruction will naturally write to register 20 here, right, in this particular cycle. But the next, but the next instruction will be reading the register file in this cycle, right? So if you look at the timing of these two instructions, so time goes in this direction. So these are my clock cycles, right? Okay. So first instruction that produces register 20 is here. This is the instruction. The next instruction that reads register 20 will be reading, will be reading from the register file here. But this is written only here. So it's going to get a wrong value from register 20 for sure. Is that clear to everybody? So that's a data hazard. So to do something to avoid this problem. The first problem is easier to solve in the sense that the solutions are easier. You can say that, well, branches are not every instruction, so I can wait whenever I see a branch. But this is very frequent, back-to-back -back register users. I produce a value, you consume in the next instruction. Okay. So if you here say that, well, I'm going to delay this register read till this point, that's correct. But you're going to, get, going to take a very, very large performance loss. Is it clear, these two types of hazards? Okay, so, um, and there is a third type which is called structural hazard that arises due to resource conflicts. 
Um, it happens if the same resource is accessed in at least two stages of the pipe, like the one we talked about, register file, uh, memory, and all. Control hazards, problems with branches. A branch does not resolve immediately after it is fetched. So what to fetch in the next cycle, we don't know. Uh, defines an important parameter called branch penalty. We'll talk about that. That is, how many cycles do you lose if you if you choose not to not to you know not to go, go ahead and wait until the branch is off. Or you do something that's wrong. Okay. So we'll define this particular term very soon. What a branch penalty is. Okay. And the third one is data hazards. Uh, dependent instructions may not execute back to back if dependence does not resolve. So what you get is um, speed up of pipeline is pipeline depth over one plus stall cycles per instruction. Okay. Because of these hazards, you may have to introduce stall cycles. Okay. Um, so essentially what happens is that you, you really do not get speed of pipeline equal to pipeline depth. It gets divided by certain other over, over factors. Okay. So first let us look at uh, structural hazard because um, as such, um, it's boring in the sense that there is no smart solution to it. Usually structural hazards are resolved by throwing in more resources. So um, if you have fewer resources than needed, then you normally have structural hazard. Um, for example, if you have an unpipelined functional limit, so essentially what that means is that if the functional limit takes 20 nanoseconds to com complete one operation, the next operation cannot be started on that functional limit before 20 nanoseconds. Okay. So essentially every 20 nanoseconds, you can start one operation. Okay. That's one type of structural hazard. Because essentially what I'm saying is that even if I have an operation ready to go, I cannot send it because I don't have functional limits. Okay. On the other hand, if, you, if I had two of these things, I could have issued two such operations in parallel. Okay. So that's why it's a structural hazard. And we already talked about these two things, uh, memory or register file course, because as, as I mentioned, you need to read from register file and write to register file. So unless you have separate read and write ports, there is no way to resolve this central hazard. So essentially, what I'm saying is that you throw in more resources to resolve this. So the question now is that, well, it's, it sounds funny, right, that we're saying that, well, I deliberately have fewer resources than I need. Because I know that I need so much, but why should I have then fewer resources, right? So why, what is the reason? Well, the primary reason is the reduction in complexity, yes, right? So you may say that, well, I, I, could have, I could have gotten rid of such a hazard completely if I had 100 ALUs, sure. But would you have a, hundred, would you have a processor with 100 ALUs? Not. Because the simple reason is that maybe once in a while you require 100 ALUs, but not all. So it unnecessarily increases your complexity and also increases your power and energy consumption. So that's why <coughs> you normally design a processor for the common case, as you say. That's what Amdal law says, right? And in the rare cases, you resort to some other way of resolving these hazards. Okay. So make the common case fast. Pipeline div divider may only waste silicon state. So dividers are seldom pipeline. Okay. Even though you know that. If you don't pipeline the divider, it's going to take a long time. Okay. So if you have two division operations side back to back, the second one will have to wait. But you won't do this because that's not a common case. So you look at the frequencies of such occurrences and decide what to do. Okay. So all types of hazards introduce stalls or pipeline bubbles. So here is an example. Suppose you have 40% data memory accesses in the program. Okay. <coughs> And you have just one memory port, let's say. Adding the second memory port slows down clock by k times. So uh, uh, don't ask me why this happens. Uh, so th this, this has to do with how memory modules are actually built. That why introducing a new port would slow down a memory module. Okay. Why should that be? So th that, that has to do with the electrical properties of these particular systems, how they are designed. So I'm not going to details of that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is true that when you add ports to a memory structure, it's going to slow down. And here what I'm saying is that adding a second memory port slows down the clock by k times. So the question now is what is maximum k so that two ported systems is same k? Because now essentially I have to argue, right? 
that I am going to pipeline a processor. I know the statistics. So now the designer has two options. Either you go in a single port in memory system and you know take the stalls because of that, or you have a two port in memory system but actually design a processor with a slower clock. So which one is better? So for that I need to know the break-even point. Right? What is the maximum k so that two ported system sees the same gain? Because then I can go back to the electrical engineer and say that, well, look, can you design a memory module with this ratio k? Okay, then I'll be fine. Otherwise, if the answer is no, then I have to rethink that, you know, should I change the design? So how do you capture this? If I have a single ported memory, um, what's going to be my execution time for this program? You can assume a clock frequency of something x. How do you calculate this? So if I have a single port, whenever the data memory is in use, I should not be able to use that memory model, right? Because the data and instruction memory are same, it's memory, that's it. So whenever I access data from memory, if I have a single port, I cannot access instruction. Right? So what's the implication of that? What gets affected? Mm -hmm. There was only one instruction in the whole cycle. So if you, yeah, so here is my pipeline. I can fetch here, I can fetch here, but I cannot fetch here, right? This has to wait. I can only fetch here, <coughs> right? So can you quantify? Yes, how do you quantify this? What is going to be my execution time in this case? So for every data memory access, what am I adding to the execution time? One cycle extra, right? Yeah. So I can I can say that my CPI is going to be what? CPI one port. Point six plus point four into two, right? Can I can I do that for a pipeline interpretation? That's a that's a fair enough approximation, right? Okay. So how much is that? One point. Okay, all right. So my execution time one port. Let's assume that I have just one instruction in this program. I can normalize that. Or if you want, let's assume we have n instructions. So that's one point four into frequency times number of instructions n. All right. Okay. Not frequency. I'm sorry. Cycle time. So let's call it tau. 1.4 tau n. All right. Is it clear to everybody? I've made a gross approximation here, okay. but this is going to be more or less okay. Okay. What about CPI two port? CPI two port? Sorry. One. Right. So execution time two port. going to be what? My cycle time, sorry, k tau n, right? Right? Okay. So I want them to be equal, right? So uh, or if I want my two ported system to be better, I want this, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. So k is less than 1.4. Okay. So adding a port should not slow down my clock by more than 40 percent. That's what it says. If it does, then I cannot go to a two-port system. Any question for this? So keep this in mind that um, every time you are going to throw in some resource to resolve a structural hazard, you are going to lose somewhere else. So there is always a trade-off. In most of the most of the things that you come across in <coughs> computer systems, it's usually not a one-way win. Okay, you lose somewhere, 
and that we have uh, carry out the data analysis and figure out which one, which way it should go. So let's take a look at control hazard a little more carefully. Okay. So this is the problem uh, that is depicted here. Um, cycles go in this direction. So these are my each cycle stage. Okay. All right. So here is a branch instruction, which is which could be anything. I'm I'm putting branch if equal to zero. Okay. And that executes here. Okay. So what we have shown in the diagram is actually it resolves here. Okay. So let's assume that we can actually squeeze in that multiplexer into the execute state. Okay. So we're talking about this particular multiplexer. This one. Okay. So let's assume that we can actually squeeze this in into this particular cycle. Okay. So that it doesn't spill over here. So I can resolve my PC, the next PC in the third cycle. Okay. The problem is that I don't know what to fetch in these two cycles. Okay. Right. Because um, here the branch is not yet computed. Here the branch is not yet computed, actually it's being computed. And here I know where to fetch one. Provided I have a bypass path, which tells me that okay, this is my this is your PC to fetch one. Right? Okay. Is this clear to everybody? Okay. So um, these are called two pipeline bubbles. Um, it increases your average CPM. If you do nothing, if you, if you say that, well, I'm going to just wait. So in that case, essentially what you're saying is that for every branch instruction, you're adding two cycle overhead, two extra cycles. Right. So now the question is, can we really reduce it to one bubble? Okay. Let's let's go one one step at a time. Okay. Right. So so instead of reducing both the bubbles together, let's first ask this, this simpler question: that can I somehow get rid of one bubble out of these two? Okay. So at this point, we need a couple of definitions. Um, actually, Sudan has already defined these two terms, target and fall through. Um, so in this case, uh, when the branch executes, whatever label that appears here <coughs> is a target. Okay. Okay. That's called a target. Fall through is the next instruction. Okay. So if the branch doesn't go to target, it will fall through. All right. Okay. So MIPS R3000 has one bubble. So that's, that's a pipeline MIPS processor, uh, very similar to the one we're looking at. So the question is, how do they actually manage to do this one bubble instead of two? So essentially, what they have done is, so by the way, this particular bubble that they had is called a branch delay slot. Right? So this is the instruction just after the branch, which has the bubble. Right? Um, <clears throat> so how do they actually get rid of one bubble? So what they do is they actually exploit clock cycle phases. Okay. On the positive half, they compute the branch condition, and on the negative half, they fetch the target. Okay. So if you now look at, they are saying that they will always do instruction fetch in half cycle. Okay. It happens only in the second half of the cycle, the instruction fetch. Okay. And the branch execution will complete within the first half of the cycle. So now what do you have? You have the branch instruction in this. Here, okay. here you have a bubble, and now you actually know the fetch target here, right here in this cycle. Okay. Because the branch execution completes in the first half, it communicates the PC to the fetcher, and the fetcher fetches in the, in the second half of the cycle. Okay. So essentially, can somebody tell me what do I lose by doing this? Of course, I gain back one cycle, definitely, one instruction. I have got rid of one bubble. But I must be losing something. What is that? Half cycle should be long enough to... Complete. Exactly. My half cycle should be long enough <coughs> to accommodate the branch instruction <coughs> execution and also long enough to complete the fetching actually from memory. Okay. Right? So in a sense, you may be sacrificing in terms of cycle time. You may be running your process at a slower frequency, but you are gaining back one bubble. So only the branch instructions execute in the half phase and execute Yes. Other yes. Other can spin over. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So branches. So essentially, what does that mean? If we go back again, so we refer to this diagram over and over. So what this means is that if you look at what the branches do, they do two things, right? They will compute the target here in the A, and they will carry out a comparison. Here. Okay. They go in parallel. Okay. 
And in most cases, you can expect that this is going to be the critical path. Okay, this is not. This is a simple comparison. Actually. So all I'm asking is, can I finish this addition in half a cycle? That's what I'm really demanding. May or may not be possible depending on how long a half a cycle is. Yeah. Yeah. On the research branch, you tend to know that it's a branch instruction. Yes, you know it here. Yeah, you know it here. So uh, yes. we can have an alternative like uh, on the third cycle, yes. the second cycle would uh, fetch the next instruction itself. Okay. The third cycle fetches the target instruction. And on the fourth cycle, when the branch is executed, we yeah. get to know whether the right answer was the next instruction or the uh, target instruction. Right. So, essentially, we have created only one bubble. Yeah. So, here we don't need a, a half cycle. Um, we don't need to increase the clock time. And well, here you have two bubbles, right? The, the one after the branch and the target. No, I'm I'm fetching both the instructions. So, so you have to keep one, right? You're saying. Yeah. Okay, so, alright. Okay. That I will know what the uh, That's possible, yes. So um, you're complicating your PC sequence as well. So essentially what you're saying is that um, after the branch I'm going to fetch the fall through all the time. Yeah, and then I will fetch the Then I'll change my PC to the target and then I may want to change the PC again. Back to the right one. Yeah. Yeah, that's possible. Yes, you can do that. So you're saying that um, here I'm going to fetch the fall through, yeah. right? Here I'm going to fetch the target. Uh, which I know from the yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you almost know. Yeah. Right. There is one small problem. You are, can somebody tell me what extra one thing I need to be able to do? Sorry? New target we need at the same steps. Uh, yeah, so, so if you remember, the branches come with the offset within their instruction. But you need one more thing to complete the target. What is that? Sorry? Condition. No, no, condition is different. So he's saying that I just need to know the target. So there are two things that come with branches, right? One is the fall through, which is PC plus one. Otherwise, the target. The part of the target is in the instruction. But I don't know the target yet here. I just need to know the offset. What do I need extra on top of that? Sorry? You need an adder, exactly. You need an adder here to be able to complete the target, right? Yeah. So, yes. So, if you can afford an adder um, in the decoder, yes, then you can do that. MIPS doesn't have that. So, is it clear to everybody what MIPS has done to solve the problem? I mean, not to really solve the problem. They have reduced it from two bubbles to one bubble. Okay. Um, the PC update hardware that is selection between target and the next PC works on the lower edge. So, yeah, so on the lower edge, you have the multiplexer, which is the new PC and the other edge. Any question on this? Clear? So, how do they actually maintain this constraint that the execute branches execute in the first half? And well, that's how they design their hardware. So, you design the hardware through the same ALU unit. Yeah. But you, you're saying that the other ALU instructions may spill over the other half. Yeah, so they have designed the adder to be operating the half. So the adder is optimized yes. in that ALU. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So the ALU has other operations, right? Other than the adder operations. They can spill over. But yeah, I mean, if you do this, in, you have probably made the ALU to operate on the, in half cycle for most instructions. Because adder is often, you know, one of the longest ones. Yeah. The logical instructions are more simple. Any other question on this? So this is your branch delay slot, this bubble. Okay, all right. So now the question is, clearly I cannot get rid of this. Okay. The way it is given, it's impossible to get rid of this bubble. No way. So what can I do here that is still useful? Can anybody suggest? How can I make good use of this branch delay slot. Instead of losing the cycle all the time, can I use it? We can insert some other instructions uh, after the uh, branch instruction in this cycle. What type of instruction can you put there? Or, or from where can you bring these instructions? Can I put any instruction here? Will that be correct? No, not any instruction. Not any instruction. Okay, all right. Uh, 
instructions sufficiently far for this kind of instructions so that it doesn't use the results in case of Instructions are sufficiently far from the branch instruction. So let's take an if else uh, control. Okay. So this is my branch. This will be transferred to a branch instruction. And in most cases, <coughs> this is going to be the target. This is the fault. Okay, now, yes. What are you saying? From where can I break this instruction? Which is going to be useful. Will be As I suggested, I cannot fill in any instruction. Can you clarify on that? Why? Why can't I put anything here? Suppose if you insert one of the instructions which is an if part. Okay. So if the branch is taken, then that will be used. Exactly, right. So that's a, that's a very good example. If the branch is taken, I should not be executing anything here. Okay. So clearly, I cannot put something from here in the branch list. So what can I then? Here. Yeah. Exactly. So these are often called the convergence points. So branch is diverging and then it's going to converge here. And these are often used for um, filling up the branch delay slot. Instructions from here. Okay. But you have to be careful. Why? No value might depends on the value. Exactly. So the value that is produced by this instruction. Like for example, suppose this instruction is writing to register 20. 20 should not be used on the path that the branch is going to execute actually. Okay, otherwise, you get a wrong value for register 20. So you have to be very, very careful when boosting something to the branch plus okay. Alright? Or any other option? Yes? You can move something above the Exactly. So you can move something from here to the branch plus Okay. So similarly, again, that, that constant applies that um, only those instructions that can be moved here, uh, which, which can be delayed, the execution of which can be delayed. Okay. So this is actually somewhat an easier option to bring something from above to the delay side. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, so um, it's the job of the compiler at the end of the day to fill in the delay slot appropriately. And if the compiler cannot find anything to fill in, it will put a no option. Say that, well, I have nothing to fill in. So that essentially amounts to losing one cycle. Right? So it's still better than losing one cycle all the time. Okay. Sometimes you'll be actually doing something useful in the branch plus. Right? So, so given, given the condition at that point in time, um, given the situation, um, this was considered to be a very good solution, a smart one actually. Okay. That, uh, given the compiler the flexibility to fill in this particular slot. Okay as opposed to doing something in hardware. So you, you could hardware something actually, but instead of doing that, you have given the compiler the flexibility to fill up this particular slot. But later, it became a big headache for this. to carry forward this particular legacy, because the problem is that once you have designed a compiler which emits code, which a branch did a slot, suddenly along the line, you cannot throw away those code. They still have to run correctly on the machine. Because later, when you go on and uh, we'll see sophisticated techniques to get rid of all bounds, Okay. This becomes a headache, big headache actually. That now it would, essentially what you're saying is that well, whatever you do, you have to execute the instruction following the branch. Because your compiler is emitting code which may actually be needed to execute here, some instruction. Okay. You cannot just omit that particular instruction. So anyway, so that's your branch delay slot. Um, so the question is can we utilize the delay slot? Um, ask the compiler guy. Um, the delay slot is always executed irrespective of the fatal branch. So boost instructions common to fall through and target paths to the delay slot or from earlier that, than the branch. So that's what we have discussed just now. 
not always possible to find. You have to be careful also. Must boost something that does not alter the outcome of all through a target basic blocks. Um, if the branch delay slot is filled with useful instruction, then we don't lose anything in CPI. Otherwise, we pay a branch penalty of one cycle. So that's the branch penalty. Number of cycles you lose um, if you have nothing. Okay, so what else can we do? So this one we um, uh, we looked at actually prediction, right? In one of the examples. Um, so you could actually try to predict the outcome of the branch. So essentially, what we're asking is as early as possible with the pipeline, right? Can you tell me the two questions? First, I need to know if it's a branch. And once we know that it's a branch, can you tell me where the branch is going? Okay. Before the branch is actually executed. So that's where the importance of prediction comes in. So um, the simple, one of the simplest techniques is to put a branch target cache in the picture. Uh, this is called a branch target buffer. So essentially what this one stores is for a branch instruction, what happened to the branch when the branch executed last time? That's what it remembers in this particular branch, branch target buffer. So next time when you fetch the same branch, you can look up this buffer and know where it went last time. Of course, yes, that could be wrong. You know, that the branch will go every time along the same direction. So how do you, um, what does this BTB look like? So it's a cache, as it mentions. So it has multiple entries, right? Each entry will have a valid bit, just like your cache. Okay. Each entry will have a tag. Okay. And each entry will have a branch target. And each entry corresponds to some branch in your program. All right. And of course, in addition to this, if you have a set associative branch target buffer, you will have some bits to carry out replacement points. Okay. So there will be certain bits for replacement algorithm, which we will not discuss at this point. Okay. Like your LRU bits. How many of you haven't heard of this recently used replacement policy? Raise hands. Okay, that's wonderful. So, um, so if I want to do a re LRU replacement in BTB, I'll need some bits to remember which one is least recently used, which one is most recently used, and so on. And so on. But I'll not, I'll not uh, <coughs> refer to this for now. So, the first question that arises is, okay, fine, I have this table. Okay, how do I index it in the table? That's the first question. Okay, right. So, what am I doing? I am fetching an instruction, right? I am at a particular PC, I have fetched the instruction. What do I need to know? I need to know two things. Tell me if it's a branch. And if it's a branch, tell me where it went last time. I should get answer to both the questions by looking up this table, right? So what I do is, I take the current PC that I have just fetched from. And suppose I have here, these are normally power of 2, 2 to the k entries. Okay, right. So what I do is I shift out last two bits because instructions are four bytes long. Last two bits will be zero anyway, so there are no information. And take out the next k bits. Okay, so it's the same as doing that. So I take the la last this significant k bits after moving out the last two bits of this. Okay, use that to index into the table. So that gives me one entry in the table, right? So then I look up this particular tag entry. This tag entry stores the remaining bits of PC, the upper bits. If the upper bits of PC match the tag, then I know that, oh, this is the branch I just fetched, which is currently in the table, right? Because the tag actually matched with my upper bits of PC. So then I got Actually, the answer that, oh, this is a branch, because it's in the BT. Right. So then I look up the target. 
and I immediately know where the branch went last time. Good, and then I can change my PC and start fetching from that particular instruction in the next time. And if I'm correct, I have nullified that particular bubble that we are worried about. Is it okay with everybody? How I look up the PTP? Okay. So now essentially what I've assumed here, there is an invariant that only branches will go into this particular table. Then otherwise, by just a hit, I cannot say that it's a branch. It's actually serving as a decoder. It is decoding that it's this instruction is a branch. Okay. So that means I have to be a little careful when I insert something in the video. So what do I what do I insert, and when do I insert? There are two questions actually. Okay. So what are the answers in suggestion? What goes into this table, and when does it go into the table? Branch instructions that we get to know from the decoder. Okay. Insert the program counter in the decoder. In the CD. Now, when when do we insert? At what time in the pipeline? The branch goes to five stages, obviously, right? Okay. After execution, we get to know the target. Right. Exactly. So when the branch finally executes, I know the actual target, and of course, I know its PC because it was fetched. So then I can insert it into the, this table with the target and the tag. All right? Okay. Now, to reduce the, the space um, over it in BTB, or rather improve the, the utilization of the capacity of BTB, <coughs> usually the branches which are not taken are not inserted in the BTB. Because if you miss in the BTB, that is if you don't find this particular PC in the BTB, you will just fall through. So you never insert a branch which is not taken. You only insert the taken branches in the BTP. Okay, because that's what matters. Alright? Okay. So um, in case of a hit, the BTP tells you the target of the branch when it executed last time. You can hope that this is correct and start fetching from the predicted target provided by the BTP. Later you get the real target compare with the predicted target and throw away the fetched instructions in case of a misprediction. Keep going in predicted correctly. Okay. So is the concept clear to you? What BTP exactly stores, when it stores that, and how you look up the BTP? So it close with one small question. Can somebody tell me for what kind of control transfer instructions BTP is going to be great, it will be 100% accurate? Jump to some level. What, do the, what are they called? They have a name. Sorry? Unconditional. Unconditional jumps, exactly. Unconditional jumps will have 100%, not exactly 100%, last time you're going to be so close. Okay. But for the remaining execution of that unconditional jump, you're going to be correct. Because every time it goes to the same place. Anything else? Any other instruction? That will have 100% switch case. Sorry? Switch case. Switch case. Switch case. No. Do not. Yeah, we'll go to different cases at different times. So, only the cases we can enter in the Oh, no, but remember that these branches are going to have the same PC. So, you'll we'll be overwriting the same entry over and over. Yeah. It will, it will be very bad, actually. What else? Mm -hmm. Something that is like unconditional jump. Return. No, you don't return to the same place every time. You may call the same procedure from different places, right? Sorry? Loops? Do you think so? You will be fairly accurate, except the last time. That's right. What else? Something like unconditional jump. What about function calls? You can always go to the same place, right? You call a function, you always go to the function. So these are called direct procedure calls. There are indirect calls also, so they will be very bad.